Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. These are mud cracks from a shale. It's 1.4 billion years old from the mountains of Montana, the Belt Purcell Group. Ugh. That's a heavy sucker. Thank you for joining us today. The local time is 1.49. And we will begin our program promptly at 2 p.m. That's 11 minutes from now on an unbelievably warm Wednesday afternoon. It's like 50 degrees out there. And sun. It feels like late March or early April around here. Unseasonably warm for us here in Ellensburg, Washington. And uh, it's not going to last. Next week's supposed to be very cold, but just terrific to see that weather. Bijou was out all night playing around. Didn't even get below freezing overnight. Thank you for joining us. Boy, I'm chatty already. <laughs> Looks like we're five by five. That's terrific to see. Let me say hi to a, just a few of you. I'll email Stephen, and then we'll go back and uh, say some more hellos to everyone. There's Hans in the Netherlands, and Constant in Tucson, and uh, oh boy, scrolling too fast. Jim in Chico, California. James in Beaverton, Oregon. Let me go back a ways. Boy, just it just flies by now. How many we got? Oh my God, almost four hundred. Damn. Okay. Great to have you. Archie in Littleton, Colorado. Uh, Geneva says, hi, Nick. Tacoma, Washington. Menominee, Michigan. Rhode Island. Unity, Wisconsin. Um, Coscob, Connecticut. Hello, Dennis. Tezza says, morning, from sunny Australia. John's in Spokane Valley, Washington. I'm still back a ways. Northeast Portland, Oregon. Marysville, Washington. Alabama. Chico, Colorado. Uh, Chico, California, excuse me, Bay Strip, Texas, Beaverton, Oregon, Yorkshire, UK, Winterbach, or Winterbach, Germany, hello, Veronica, Butler, Missouri, Red Deer, Alberta, uh, scroll down to live, Martin is in Norshipping, Sweden, Yorkoping, I think at one time I knew how to pronounce that properly. Uh, sorry. Uh, Kirk's in Sweden also. McKinney, Texas. Coast Range Ophiolite, otherwise known as Oakland, California. There's Frank Raviola showing off a little bit. Humble brag. Tanana Terrain, Fairbanks, Alaska. Hello, Don. Ivana, thank you for making time for us today. Lawn Dog says, hell from Central Silesia. Sorry, Patrick. I think you meant hello, but nice to, nice to see you. Okay. Uh, email, Stephen. Sending an email to Edmonton, Alberta. Away that goes. Oh, got an email. Uh, Nick Zentner is live now. I don't think I get that every time. Do you get an email every time saying when I start going live? Maybe I do. I just don't notice it. Weird. Big red dot and everything in the subject line. Um, okay. Hello to a few more of you. Um, Bunny, Oregon. Columbus, Georgia. Kyle wonders if I feel alive. I do. I feel alive. Adventure Sombrata is in Waikile, Hawaii. Vinman's Bakery is in the house. Good afternoon. Hello, Jeff. North Dakota. That's Ed. He's out there in western North Dakota out there ways. Oh, yeah. Bo is in uh, Denmark. Gloomy, St. Louis, Missouri. Uh... San Diego, California. 
Lakewood, Washington, Farmington, New Mexico. I am far too comfortable this afternoon. I should be all nervous. I'm just not. I don't know why. I was talking to students out in the hallway. They're like, aren't you about ready to go? I'm like, yeah. They're like, aren't you nervous like normal? Like you're hacking and you're spitting and you're going to the bathroom. I'm like, no. So uh, who knows? Hey, there's Stephen. Stephen, great to see you. Thank you. Looks like we're functional there. Excellent. If you want to share your screen now, you can, Steve, and just get that in there as well. But either way, uh, we're fine. Um, so sit back and relax. I'm thinking 15 minutes or so. Yeah, maybe 20. Maybe 20 of me. Got a couple of stories and other things up my sleeve. Northern Exposure says, hi, from Rosalind, Washington. Hey, who are you? I, I feel like I should know who you are. Rosalind is an old coal mining town just 30 minutes away. Rick's in Costa Rica. Hello, Rick. Pat Miller. Things uh, must be getting the hang of this thing. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's part of it, Pat. I think so. It, it does feel like it's uh, this series is almost kind of on automatic pilot now. I don't have to think too hard when I come in and set everything up. I did the chalkboard stuff last night. Um, yeah, so maybe that's part of it. But all it takes is one show with all sorts of problems technologically that, that gets me back down to zero. So we'll keep our fingers crossed as always. Oh, look at, look at Steven. He's got his shared screen too. He's a pro already. Now I really don't have to be nervous. This guy knows what's up. Tombstone, Oregon. No, Tombstone, Arizona. Uh, finally caught up. Hey, Ed, thanks for doing your homework. You're finally, you've watched all these letters and you're, you're up to S with us. Terrific. Yeah, I still think that's the best way to go, if it's possible. I know there's a lot of hours now racked up. Each of these are like two freaking hours, but uh, those that are taking the time to keep up with the series, uh, I, I, think, I think there's a better chance you're able to follow along if you've been with us each letter in the alphabet. That's the whole gimmick of the alphabet thing. Ray is in Scandia, Minnesota. Uh, Scott says, hello, uh, hello from Phoenix, Arizona, Professor. Well, hello, uh, Scott. Uh, index Pluton, Phil is a regular. I re recognize Index Pluton every time, mostly because it's uppercase. There's backcountry Gary at the edge of the melange belt. Gary, uh, I don't think I still understand even the beginning parts of the melange belt, and that's in our freaking state. But you'll get me there. Hope we can hike again this summer. Honey Greg is telling other people they don't need to watch the first 15 minutes or the Q&A to review and catch up. So true. I don't know. Maybe people just watch the interview part and figure they get the gist. I don't know. I don't know. He doesn't know. Third person, Wednesday. Clyde Park, Montana. That's Douglas. i got about a couple minutes before I need to start concentrating here. Uh, Vancouver Island, BC Outdoorsman is Nanaimo, back home from Kona, Hawaii. I'll be good today. Well, thank you. No promises. PD Riot is in Cincinnati. And Rachel saying hi to Gary and other people. And, oh, Saber has uh, mentioned this a few times. Sorry, Saber. Uppercase. Tropic of Cancer. BCS Cabo Pulmo uh, National Park, I assume. Sabo, you are living a life of leisure, I guess, down there. Way to go. Not, at this point, you have to stay down there until we're done with the series. Like I think you are like ironclad to stay in Baja until the Baja BC series is concluded. Joe Slick Live says, uh, love you, Nick, from Twitch all over the world. Joe, I don't understand what Twitch is, but thank you for that. Andrew is in Perth, Australia. Kent's in Jackson, Louisiana. And uh, looks like I got a couple of minutes to uh, pause and concentrate and clear my head and see what I have for you today, including a big old prop, which I'll probably start with again. Seems like everything's in order. Thank you for joining us. We'll start in two minutes. Hot mic.
Okay. You're going to start with the main chalkboard. Quickly go through the models. Talk about the word radical. What do I mean by that? Flip it around. Do the two quick stories. Then the only other thing are the two other chalkboards. Right. Okay, so it's mostly the story thing you can kind of take your time with, I think. I think there's... Yeah, I think that's what, what you need to do. Oh, don't forget the laptop. The animation in the laptop. Eric photos. And then go to Steven. You really want to do the laptop before, Steven? Do you need to do that? Maybe you don't. Okay, play that by ear. Maybe you don't need the laptop before you go to Steven. Okay. All right, you need energy. You're relaxed, but you need energy. Crank it up. Crank it up. You can do this. Start with the main chalkboard and then get into the stories. Chalkboard and the stories. Come on. You can do this. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA, on the campus of Central Washington University. It is a spring-like day here. There's students everywhere, walking all over the place, going from lab to lecture and everywhere else. And I have the doors locked, and I am sequestered here inside of the main auditorium, spending time with you for the next hour and a half or whatever it is. And of course, I'm looking forward to this session, just like I have been the others as well. But there's a couple of twists with this show. The first twist is, I started from scratch. I'd never met Stephen Johnston, our guest today, until uh, uh, before the weekend, and we only talked for about 20 minutes. He's a busy guy. And I started on Sunday night reading the papers involving the ribbon continent, really for the first time. I mean, these other shows, I, I learned a little bit along the way for whatever reason, maybe in the backyard stuff I was doing two years ago. But this ribbon stuff for whatever reason, just escaped me until I really sat down. And I don't know how you've been doing with these papers, but for me personally, here's my process. Read it all the way through, underline a few words that make sense to me, ignore a bunch of names and places that mean nothing to me. And if we're up in Alaska and the Yukon and Northern British Columbia, no meaning at all. Put it down, go take a walk, three hours later, try again. And then eventually, I start making a few connections. Eventually, I come up with an understanding that some of what's going on in these papers pertains to what we've been doing in the series. And then things start going. So I've got plenty of multiple pages of questions for, for Stephen. And what a thrill and what a treat to be able to read these papers, never meet the guy, and then get a chance to ask him all sorts of stuff. And maybe you have the same approach as well, if you've been doing your homework ahead of time. Okay. Uh, where are we in the series, and where are we with these models that we started to lay out right after the holidays? Well, uh, I think we know by now that this flat slab subduction model that is still the company line, that's still the main majority opinion, among most geologists dealing with the American West uh, is under attack, wrong way to say it, but like uh, most of what we're doing in this series is realizing that this is probably not the way to go anymore. I, we don't have to push it that hard, but like all three of these are dealing with Baja BC, including today's topic. So we're, we're not inviting guests, I'm, I'm not, in, contemplating all these flat slab ideas because that's been the predominant, the dominant set of ideas for 50 years in what I was teaching for the first 25 years of my teaching career. 
So Basil Tickoff is the, the key person for us, and we've had Basil a number of times on, and so we went to the hit-and-run model with him right after the first of the year, emphasizing the hit of insular superterrain and the run of insular superterrain up the coast between 85 and 55 million years ago. Leave it alone. In the last show, we weren't really talking about hit and run. Instead, we were talking about a fixed archipelago, one of the islands of which was insular, but there were other islands out there as well. And they also saw Baja BC. I'm talking about Karn and Mitch in the last show. In their animation, they had Baja BC. They had a mega whale going up to the north. But this was informed by bedrock geology as well as uh, oceanic slabs found deep in the mantle, lower mantle, ribbon candy. But today, you can see how I've rated these, and I want to talk about my choice of the word radical. We're getting away from the company line and getting more and more imaginative, more and more against the grain, more and more, yeah, radical. Now, what does that word mean to you? I don't mean it as a negative descriptor, radical. I'm all, I'm all for new ideas. I really am, especially if they're from scientists who know a lot of detail. And we need to get our minds as open as possible today. And also the next two shows, both Saturday and next Wednesday, will be uh, Robert Hildebrand, who's also in this ribbon continent category. So we're going to have three full shows devoted to this most innovative and radical way to view the American West. You're like, okay, I think I hear what you're saying, but uh, I don't really know what I'm supposed to be ready for. Well, until about three hours ago, I didn't know either. But I think I have two specific things from Stephen's papers that I read right before lunch, two and a half hours ago, with Bijou at home. And they intersect with me and what I have been teaching. And suddenly something radical then feels quite electrifying because I know the details. I mean, if somebody says something about the Yukon Tanana and there's a new idea, I'm like, oh, sure, whatever. I don't, I don't know anything about the Yukon Tanana. But if we're talking about the Yellowstone hotspot or if we're talking about the Belt Supergroup in Glacier National Park, now I'm really interested because I have thought a lot about those two places or those two concepts. Let's try it. So I'm flipping around, and this is my improvisation, Stephen. You know what? Stephen's to blame for this. Stephen has been so kind by email and encouraging by email, even though I don't know the guy. And so he specifically is like, I like all the meanderings and the personal stuff and all that. So... I'm leaning into it today, Stephen. I don't feel too bad about doing this. All right. So let's take a key portion from the 2001 Stephen Johnston Great Alaskan Terrain Wreck paper. And here's me sketching this out about uh, half an hour ago, waiting to start with you guys. We have the Carmax lavas sitting on top of intermontane superterrain. Fine. These are flood basalts. It's a German chocolate cake. 70 million years old. Plenty of paleo mag done on it. Remember Randy Ankin, Jane Wynn? They were working with Stephen Johnson. They were up on the Carmax, and the Carmax is maybe the most important site of this entire second half of the alphabet. I know, I know Hildebrand is going to talk about it as well. So I do want to think a lot about the Carmax volcanics in Yukon, 70 million years old. Now, in Stephen's paper, He's making a case that the Yellowstone hotspot 70 million years ago created the Carmax flood basalts, which sit on top of the intermontane superterrain. That includes Yukon Tanana, the Twins, Dakinia and Quinellia, and Cache Creek in between, Grello. Okay. Yellowstone hotspot 70 million years ago. Can I show you just quickly why this is radical? Go quick, man. I live here, Ellensburg, Washington. Yellowstone hotspot today is here. I've done this a million times. I've taught, I've taught for 30 years. I've taught the Yellowstone hotspot every quarter 
uh, for 30 years, 30 plus years. Yellowstone hotspots here. Yellowstone hotspot was near Pocatello 6 million years ago. Yellowstone hotspot was down in northern Nevada 17, 17 million years ago. You want it? Six, uh, zero today. Where was the Yellowstone hotspot, according to many, 56 million years ago? It was out here. It was off the coast. It was out in the water. It was in the Pacific Ocean Basin, the Yellowstone hotspot. Were you with us last winter? We did this almost... Uh, a bunch of letters in the crazy Eocene series, we were dwelling on the fact that the Yellowstone hotspot, there's a strong case for the Yellowstone hotspot 56 million years ago to be out in the Pacific at some distance creating Celestia, greater Celestia. And half of Celestia was accreted to the Pacific Northwest and the other half of greater Celestia is, is up the coast and, and being uh, uh, subducted today, the Yakutat. But what's Stephen saying? Stephen's saying the Yellowstone hotspot has a longer history than 56. And I don't know, but like, don't we have to be quite a ways further offshore 70 million years ago with the Yellowstone hotspot? I don't know. But in Stephen's 2001 paper, he's talking about the Yellowstone mantle plume being maybe a thousand kilometers offshore in the Pacific Basin 70 million years ago. You're like, okay, I guess so. Here's why this is radical. If we have a Yellowstone hotspot a thousand kilometers out into the Pacific 70 million years ago, and if it's creating the Carmax, that means Intermontane is a thousand kilometers offshore. 70 million years ago. It's up in Yukon today, okay. But just the fact that we can pin the Intermontane, we can pin Stikinia and Cache Creek. And this is a radical, yeah, this is a radical departure. This is my old buddy, R Mappy McMapp. Two years ago, I was in the backyard trying to learn these things for the very first time. That's when I should have been reading, reading Stephen Johnston stuff. But what was I teaching? I was teaching uh, Royal Blue was Quinellia. Grello was Cache Creek. Dodger Blue was Stikinia. And these are the twins that have a pericratonic signature, meaning that they potentially were rifted away from old North America in the early days, back in the Paleozoic sometime. Cache Creek, work by Stephen Johnston. I think I was reading Steve's paper then. Tethian fossils, far traveled, coming from across the Pacific. Remember the green bean, and we're making the oral cline, and we're doing all that. But the point is, the con I was teaching the conventional accretion history that Intermontane accreted to Western North America 170 million years ago. But Stephen, in this 2001 paper, is saying the stuff's way out there in the ocean, 70. That's one example today is radical. Here's another quick example of how today, uh, today is radical. That's Glacier National Park in Montana. That's where I discovered geology. I ran out of money, University of Wisconsin. I took the train out literally uh, to East Glacier. I pumped gas at Lake McDonald Lodge. I worked in the general store. And on off, off days, you know, hiking with all my college buddies that I had made, you know, new friends from around the country, I did hikes up in the uh, uh, Glacier Park wilderness. In the National Park. Where is it? Hang on. Hang on. I stole this from the general store. I feel better confessing that, all right? I worked in the general store at the end of the summer when we put all the magazines away, all the People magazines, all the Mother Earth News magazines. I, I didn't put this one back in the box. I just took it. And I had been using it all summer. And this is what got me interested in geology. Geology along the Going to the Sun Road, Glacier National Park. And I knew uh, from that introduction to geology 
that there were all sorts of very old Precambrian sedimentary rocks, part of the belt series that had preserved ripple marks, preserved stromatolites, preserved mud cracks, similar to this. This is outside my office in the hallway. I grabbed it. I love it. I look at it every day. These are mud cracks from the belt supergroup. Am I on a tangent? No. Why? Well, the conventional message in Glacier National Park is that the upper half of those mountains are Precambrian and the lower half of those mountains in Glacier National Park are much younger, Mesozoic. Old rock on top of young rock, that means there's a major thrust fault called the Lewis Thrust Fault that's separating Precambrian that was shoved up on top of these Cretaceous rocks. But they're all fine grained. They're all a bunch of shales like I just showed you. You want another radical thought? Stephen in 2001 says, well, have they always been thrust faults? Is it possible in those shales of the Rocky Mountains, what we now know as thrust faults and have thrust fault relationships, maybe were strike slip faults in an earlier chapter? Is it possible that Baja BC-like faults are hidden in shales of the passive margin of North America. And you want to be more radical? Maybe not all the passive margin sediments of North America are passive margin sediments of North America. Maybe some of those shales are passive margin sediments of the frickin' ribbon continent. And you're like, I don't know what that is. And you're like, it's a good thing you tuned in. Damn, this is good. Last thing we're doing with the chalkboard, Stephen, five minutes, we're coming to you. Um, I tried this last night. I don't think I liked it. I may still not like it. But at least it gives us a place to start. This is what I tried to do to summarize the thinking of our last episode. Fixed Archipelago, my label, they're not using that label. Karin Siglock and Mitch Mahalanek. Many of you enjoyed that show. I did too. Thank you for tuning into that one. 170 million years ago, this is my way to summarize the animations we were playing back and forth, G plates and everything else with Mitch. Karin and Mitch say Intermontane is on to old North America by 170 million years ago. And so there's a vast ocean, the Mezcalera Ocean at our latitude, between the Intermontane and the Insular. And that there's a trench with teeth on this side, which means there's subduction going westwardly underneath the Insular superterrain. So that's the whale that's eventually going to go up the shore. But it's not a mega whale. To get a mega whale, we need these two guys hooked together. We don't have that, at least at this stage in the story. So Karn in particular was emphasizing that if we finally close this ocean and subduct it all away and get it down into the lower mantle, maybe there'll be some remnants of that crunched or closed ocean basin. And that's what I'm trying to portray here, an oceanic suture. I'm going to try that phrase for the next few shows. A place where there's green rocks. Hell, I still got my friend the green rocks. So if we have an oceanic suture... We've got a place where we have a bunch of deep ocean rocks that are now up here on land. And those oceanic sutures are soft rocks, they're brittle rocks. Maybe or may, they may or may not be prone to northward translation along some sort of fault or shear zone or something. But the point is, with this model, our oceanic suture is between insular and intermontane. And you maybe caught the message real quick from Mitch Mahalanuk in the last episode that he thought maybe a major Baja BC structure was through the Cache Creek, which is in Intermontane and not any further east. I didn't really sidetrack him or look into that, but 
That's my best way. Noticing I'm just doing accordion stuff here. What happened to the symbols, you say? Well, that's a long time ago, and it's hard, as you can see, to kind of get all these four dimensions going on a, on a simple chalkboard. But that's, that's an attempt there. So they, they did have almost a full mega whale heading north, if you remember, from the Edward Klinet animations. Okay, as a way of introducing the ribbon continent, this is the only way I'm doing it, and then we'll go to Stephen, and he can flesh things out for us as we talk. Both of the papers today by Stephen Johnston focus on the intermontane. So I'm adding insular here, and I think we might be adding insular to this concept with Hildebrand in the next two shows. I don't think we'll be doing much with the insular with Steve, but actually, Steve, I'm, not, I'm wondering if you left insular off on purpose, or we can kind of get into that. But our guest today has spent a lot of time thinking about the boundary between Intermontane, known as the Ribbon Continent, and Old North America, and those passive margin sediments. And so again, I'm just trying in this very broad brush approach that this continent, this ribbon continent out in the water, I and mean, we, again, we can just cover this up if we want. If we just want to think of intermontane, what is the ribbon continent? It's the intermontane that's 8,000 kilometers long. It's truly a continent that is way longer than it is wide. 8,000 kilometers today from Siberia down to BC. But Johnston has been involved in paleomag. And he sees at least a couple thousand kilometers worth of northward translation of the entire ribbon continent, of the entire intermontane. I thought it was just Insula that was doing all that crazy motion. Stephen, we got to talk about that too. But as I understand it, there's westward subduction with the ribbon continent guys as well. The ribbonistas. Stephen and Bob. Final point, once we finally accrete and we, got, we push everybody west, that's why I've offset these things as this indicates, we have more than a mega whale, I think, because we go intermontane. Steve Johnston says, I don't see major translation within the intermontane. I'm not sure I even see major translation at the oceanic suture, which Steve is seeing as the boundary between Intermontane and Old North America, I think. He says we got to go into the Old North American crust itself. Want me to do it one more time? What's the Old North American crust look like? Most famously, it looks like this. Fine grain shales of the Rocky Mountain uplift. I'm sweating now, and I know why. That's a heavy slab, baby. That's my attempt to get us into it. We're not going to the laptop. We're going to Steve right now. And we'll just follow our nose. We're going to Edmonton, Alberta. All systems go. Good afternoon, Steve. How are you? I'm doing great, and you? Uh <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm almost nervous at how radical I apparently I am. <laughs> well, that's a good place to start. Like, are you really that radical or not? I mean, uh, I want to I want to kind of get there. So, could I get a little bit of your backstory first, if you don't mind? So, um, I assume you you did your schooling up in Canada. Which universities are we talking about? I did my. BSc in geology at McGill in Montreal. Um, interestingly, my, my very first course at McGill was mineralogy taught by a guy named Don Francis, excellent oh. igneous petrologist. And he ended up being part of the CarMax group research team. And the, the funny thing about this was that mineralogy, my very first course, I failed. And, and Don, I remember... Don called me into his office halfway through the, that 
first semester and said, you're going to fail if you don't buck up. And I was like, whoop. <laughs> so I ended well, that's up really, <laughs> yeah, that's really cool that you kept in touch with him and, and involved him in your work or vice versa. That's really neat. I, I, yeah. I'm guessing we're about the same vintage. I, I was in school in the 80s. Is that what decade we're talking about? Yeah, I started at McGill in 79. I started in um, economics and business and um, eventually got my head straight and, and moved into uh, geology. But um, yeah, and from there I went to um, University of Alberta, where I am now, did a master's on the um, structure of the foothills of the Canadian Rockies, just west of Edmonton. And then I um, switched... Uh, pretty much drastically to uh, upper amphibolite and granulite facies rocks in southwest Yukon. So I just did a big mapping project for my PhD on the um, Yukon Plateau in southwest Yukon across. And here's again the, the problem <laughs> with, with uh, geology. Um, previous work had mapped out the boundary between Stikinia, one of the biggest terrains, and um, what we now call Yukon Tanana terrain to the west of it. And my thesis was going to be um, a detailed structural study, one of the first structural studies of a well-exposed terrain bounding fault. And it turned out just to be an intrusion. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, yeah, best laid plans. It, it is. Right. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it took me a long time to finish my thesis. Um, I ended up working a year for the BCGS mapping uh, coal bearing strata in the Ro in the uh, northern Rockies. For them, I did four years um, as an exploration geologist for Shell Canada and Shell International. God, and then I was one of um, the first five geologists hired to start the fledgling Yukon Geological Survey. Oh, which, wow. And that's where I got started in this debate. Um, yeah, it, this is a long story, I know. I, I ended up leaving um, the survey after four years, four great years. And I went, I was a prof in South Africa for three years at Durban. And then from there, I moved back to um, Victoria. And I did 16 years at Victoria. And then came all the way back to... Um, University of Alberta in 2016. Well, okay. So the experience is is all over the place. You're, you you don't have one little trick that you're using over and over again. I mean, that, that backstory, I think, is very, very helpful. Um, was it the Yukon chapter when things started to seem a little off to you as far as it feels like I don't know if, if it was a if it was a kind of a big jump away from the traditional way of viewing some of these erogenies or these structures, or if there were some people that got you thinking uh, along some different lines. Like what led you to these papers in the two thousands that that clearly seemed to be against the grain. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not. I don't. And I don't intend to end up against the grain. In fact, um, as a kid, I was forced to play the accordion. Um, so, so was I. So maybe I'm an anti-accordion guy just because of having <laughs> been forced into it for so long. It turned me into I a simple it. person. But um, uh, I remember, uh, I think it was 1987. We have this, we have the Cordier and Tectonics workshop annually in Canada. And I was attending it because I was working on, you know, terrain geology as part of my PhD almost everybody was interested in terrains, but the whole terrain story is, is older than the, you know, what we're talking about, this Cretaceous yeah. displacements. And um, I remember Guy Marquis giving the, um, a talk on his work on the CarMax group. And my thesis area in Southwest Yukon had CarMax group unconformally overlying everything. So I'd, I'd seen it and I'd walked over it. And um, and we thought of it as gardening, <laughs> you know, kind of irrelevant volcanic rocks that get in the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, Guy gave this talk and said, uh, these rocks, you know, have traveled 2,000 kilometers from the south. 
and I think it um, it it sat with me. I mean, it it was puzzling, and we all just discarded it. We all just said this is crazy, and we we ignored it. But it always bugged me. And I remember when I started at the Yukon Geological Survey in '92, um, and I'll show a couple of slides of this. Uh, Craig Hart, one of the other geologists who um, was hired at that time had been working on Whitehorse Trough, which is the northern continuation of the Intermontane Belt. And he was also looking at Carmack's group unconformly overlying the older terrain rocks. And I was mapping west of Whitehorse Trough and also in Carmack's group. And we, we decided to go look at the Marquis and Globerman sampling sites. And uh, we thought the rock was pretty shitty. Um, <laughs> We weren't impressed and, no. um, you know, we thought, because I was mapping some really pristine uh, Carmax group, and we were thinking if we get paleomagnetists out on these pristine rocks, I'll bet you we can make this go away. And, and that's where it started. I, I was a non-believer. You were a non-believer and it was your idea to, to get on the phone with, with Jane Wynn or somebody and get them up there and take some samples? I wouldn't samples. say it was my idea, but I think, you know, Craig and I talked and then we had a Yukon Geoscience Forum and we talked with Jane. I knew Jane and um, I didn't know Randy because he had just been hired at that point in time uh, because of Ted's retirement. Yeah, and And it was through this discussion that we thought, well, let's let's do this, you know? And, um, and my, my um, guess was that we would put Baja BC to rest by doing this study. Fascinating. Uh, before I lose it, the earlier guy who said the CarMax moved 2000 kilometers, did he know about Paleomag as well? Or was that a totally different line of evidence to, to think nope, that it was- that was a, a French uh, guy Guy Marquis and um, and Brian Globerman, I think his name was. Brian worked yeah. at uh, worked with Ted at the uh, Pacific Geoscience Center. Guy Marquis came over. I I can't remember the university where he was doing his PhD, but it, this was part of his um, his graduate studies. So it was a paleomagnetic study. It was paleomag. Got it. And that was again kind of uh, kind of the bias was that. Oh, this French guy come, comes over. He knows nothing about the Cordillera, and he tells us these rocks have all moved. Come on, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, let's get a North American up there. Let's have let's let's drill these holes uh, with our drills and see what we get. And, yeah. And maybe this is the time to. You got a couple of photos of of your field work, maybe with Paleo Mag, if you want to go there. Or you want to just keep talking like this? It's up to you. Uh we can go. To the photos there were kind of two things i started um my my little slide deck with on just two points about the paleo mag i wanted to um i wanted to address before we get into the ribbon continent and okay. and um the two things are the yo-yo okay this idea that that things have to go south and then north again and that's pretty problematic and the other thing is comes back to a great line of Randy Enkins when he said, uh, declination, declination, I don't give a rip about declination. And, and I, <laughs> and, you know, he's right. Um, but I want to just explain why um, maybe we should think about these two things differently. And I don't know if I can stand up here and I just, I have a rock and hey. this is, this is, uh, where am I here? This is, um, mm -hmm. This is actually car. Uh, this is the crow's nest volcanics, and uh, oh, I'm going to I'm going to use it to represent uh, North America, which is dodgy because uh, you. I think you would have heard Randy and Jane talk about how the crow's nest volcanics is right in the foothills, but yields the same uh, far sided pole that that the Cretaceous rocks in the Cordillera yield. So it's a bit problematic, and maybe we'll come back to that. Uh, okay. I'm going to try and use this, and I think I'm going to have to stand up here to see if I can get far enough away from my camera. Oh my God, this is wonderful! So, so here's uh, Insular Intermontane, right? And people are, and this is North America, and people are saying, okay, well, 
the paleomag means it's got to go south and then it's got to go north. And I mean, it's hard enough finding a record of it going north, but south and north. But that's not really what we what happens or maybe we don't have to have it happen like this. If because remember, this is a relative motion. So yeah. if our uh, insular inner montane are moving slowly north. OK, and if North America is moving rapidly north, uh, it'll it'll pass. Right. And it'll look from a North America point of view like this is going south. Mm. OK, so what North America does is it goes rapidly north and then it slows down and then it starts to move mostly to the west. OK, so so I'm dyslexic in this to say the least and this is going to be impossible for me but here we go this is moving slowly this is moving rapidly it passes it then it starts like this and this keeps coming and passes it so the yo-yo is is relative right it it's not necessarily that the insular intermontane go crashing south and then have to come back north again they just go slower and more steadily to the north than North America, which races uh, to the north and goes uh, past it and then slows down and starts going mostly west. Got it? I've got it. I mean, bonus points for you. I don't know if you're trying to get some sort of, you know, great score as being a guest here, but like <laughs> bringing your own props and everything else, for Christ's sake, that's amazing. Thank you for that. Okay, um, that's, that's one. So number two is the declination. Declination, I don't care about. So here's why we might care about declination, okay? okay. So we always think about declination. I'm going to do the stand-up thing here again. We always think about declination. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to rain on your parade here. Yep. You're, you're reversed as I know. we see you. So yeah. it's like you say you're like it's – yeah, got it. Keep doing it. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. for you, it's like almost impossible to flip yourself around. Please, know, please. So. go for it. Go for okay, it. so declination. Here's the idea behind the declination, right? North America yeah. again. Here's yeah. our uh, insular intermontane. And they all yield clockwise rotations. All the paleomag, right? So Randy's saying what we're really interested in is inclination, which tells us relative latitude, right, with respect. And he's like, I don't care about this, this declination, right? And in fact, how we usually think about the declination is as, as the terrains move up the coast, they interact with and they roll along like the coast like that. And that gives rise to these, um, there's my happy face, that gives rise to this ball bearing motion that gives rise to the, the clockwise rotations, okay? But there's another way. We'll call this the ball bearing model. Uh, we're going to do the uh, what's called the windshield wiper model. Okay. Here's the windshield wiper model. Okay. This is, oh, here we go. North America. Okay. There's our insular intermontane. Yeah. Let's say the insular intermontane are down around the Sierras right here. Okay. Yeah. They just do that. They end up clockwise rotated, and they end up moving north. Okay, so they start south, off the coast, oriented, oriented normally. They don't interact like ball bearings along the coast. They do this windshield wiper rotation, so they end up way north of where they started and clockwise rotated. Huh. Okay, so... And I think Jane Wynn actually published a figure to that effect in a review paper she did with Ted, but I couldn't find it. Jane, you have to let us know. I think it was the DNAG review, but um, so those two, you know, points have been talked about a lot. The, the declination is something we don't have to worry about, but maybe we do. And the, um, the relative yo-yo yeah, it doesn't have to be this things moving south along the coast and then north again. Well, with the windshield, are you saying what I think you're saying? That if you if you do your windshield motion, you're not going to have a bunch of strike slip faults then? It's some sort of grander clockwise you thing have to get involving rid, the ocean? Yeah, you have to get rid of everything on the inside of the windshield though, right? You have to... Yeah. So, 
you have to, in, probably you have to subduct a lot of crust. And yes, you're absolutely right. There isn't necessarily going to be um, any major strike slip faults involved in that windshield wiper model. That's that might be radical. <laughs> <laughs> so you're living up to your billing now. This is good. Let's let's do some slides and sure. um, and that will give us more. Uh, that'll give me more thoughts on how we want to continue. Are, are you would, are you thinking just doesn't matter. Let's just bring them in. Yeah. Um, OK. You, oh, oh, beautiful. Thank you. This is this is a slide by. Um, Dennis Kent, uh, excellent paleomagnetist, and Ted Irving. I think this is a paper they published in 2010. And, and this is showing that, um, uh, explaining that lack of a yo-yo. Okay, so mm -hmm. here is combined insular intermontane and the Triassic is the red color. And what you can see is that, that the insular intermontane here is about the same latitude as it is today with respect mm -hmm. to North America. Mm. North America, this is its vector of motion at that time. And this is the inferred vector of motion for the insular intermontane. You can see this is moving north more rapidly. And by the time we get to the mid Cretaceous here, okay, the insular intermontane have moved quite a bit south relative to the Craton. Hmm. Okay, but not because they've been moving south, it's because they've just been moving north slower than the continent. It's going to take me a while to get that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to think on that one. I, this the, it, in, instinctively, it makes sense, but I don't think I totally get it. Please continue. But that this feels like a big moment, Stephen. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, as I said, this is a Dennis Kent and, and Ted. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a, a something that um, uh, Randy said about geologists. He said uh, they're incredibly hardworking. The people he's worked with, Brian Mahoney and Paul Link and others. And and I just want to make sure that uh, the geologists out there appreciate how incredibly hardworking the the paleomagnetists are. And mm -hmm. and so this is Randy. This is us up on the Dempster Highway. Highway is. <laughs> a pretty misleading term for the Dempster. Um, and so this is up uh, in the Richardson Mountains. And I, why I wanted to show this picture is um, these are, uh, this is Randy's feet inside these boots. These were Ted Irving's boots. When, when Ted wow. retired and Randy got the job to replace Ted, Ted actually gave Randy his boots. So these are, this is like the epitome of big shoes to fill. And, amazing, uh, amazing. So, and Randy has done a, a, an amazing job filling those shoes. So it, <laughs> it's great working with Randy and, and Jane and, um, and yeah, they're incredibly hardworking. And, and my, I just have to, one little digression. When I started at University of Victoria um, and Ted was just, you know, 20 kilometers up the road in Sydney, um, and I sat down at my desk the first day and the phone rang and it was Ted Irving. And I was like, oh, wow, Ted Irving is phoning me. And Ted says, you know, welcome to uh, to Victoria and uh, look forward to working with you. And he says, do you mind if I give uh, you a bit of advice on how to have a, a good career? And I was like, whoa, yeah, absolutely, Ted. I'm, I'm just, you know, honored that you'd even think of giving me advice. And he said, Stephen, always buy Italian boots. <laughs> and then he hung up. <laughs> well, there you go. Oh, I've, I've always worn Italian boots ever there since. There you go. Oh, you followed your orders. That's good. <laughs> Shall we go back? Okay, here we go. Let's. Yeah. So there's the Marquis and Globerman paper and published in 88. So yeah, I think I saw him give a talk in 87. And, and here's the problem is that my thesis area is right here, right on the west side of this in, intermontane belt. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so uh, this is a, a picture taken in my, um, in my uh, PhD field area. And we're essentially standing here. This is a, a field conference. I took people out to show them that it wasn't a terrain boundary 
this was actually before I defended my thesis. That is a really dumb idea to take people <laughs> out to your area when you haven't yet defended. Of course, all of the eyes here, everyone sees something different. They see right. things I never saw. Tremendous group. But we're, we're standing on essentially metam Paleozoic metamorphic rocks here of the yukon Tanana terrain. And we're looking at early Jurassic intrusions back here of Stikinia. Mm -hmm. And we can walk yukon Tanana right around the north end of the intermontane belt over to, the, to its east side where it's thrust onto North America. And it's all pinned together by middle Cretaceous plutons. So mm -hmm. this is where I'm thinking uh, the Carmax group just doesn't work. All right. um, so this, this is Craig Hart right here I was mentioning. Yeah. And this is the summer of 92. This is a group of us who've just been hired at the Yukon survey. And we're looking, this is Midnight Dome and Ophiolite sits right above Dawson City. And we're looking down the Yukon River there to the... Uh, to the southeast, and they're a Carmax group uh, sitting unconformably on the Yukon Tan in the basement right here. Mm. And this is where we got the idea, let's go do uh, more of this work with Jane and Randy. So that's how Jane uh, ended up out in Yukon with us. And you can see Jane's not only happy when she's inside and being interviewed by you, Nick, she's happy always. So she's a... <laughs> wonderful person to work in the field with uh, and, and talk about hard working. This is Randy. I mean, um, you can see this is not for the faint of heart. Like we're yes. really on a precipitous slope here and I don't know if you can make it out, but it was hailing and the hail was like the size of quarters. And, and I'm like, Randy, I think we should probably retreat. And he's like, no, no, I'm going to get this. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and finally, Jane said we carried the water for her, and we did, but she carried as well as we did uh, all the gear. So um, our camp is right here. Wow. Okay. And we carried all the gear up here to get the best outcrops of the CarMax group. That's the lake down there. I had to go down and get water from for every hole. It's <laughs> Pretty excruciating work. <laughs> so it's hard work, and uh, uh, but it, it's rewarding. You bet. Yeah, and of course that's what we came up with. Uh, we we didn't make Baja BC go away. We actually got better data. We reduced the error envelope, and we made it even a little bit more far-sighted than it was with um, with Marquis and Globerman. Mm -hmm. And and so this was. Published in 96, the year I went to South Africa and, and drawing this figure uh, with, you know, the, um, the intermontane belt here crossing over the Yellowstone hotspot. And we got Dave Engerbretson to figure out where the hotspot would be for us. And you're right, it would mm -hmm. be a long way off the coast because, of course, you have to take out this bend in the coast, which is attributable to the opening of the basin and range. So the actual coastline would have been more like that. So it's a long mm -hmm. way out. Mm -hmm. and what really bothered me is what what is this moving into? Like, um, you know, here's Carmax Group overlying all of central Yukon. Yes. So what was there? And that all right. bugged me. And, and that was the onset of my thinking. Just a couple uh, more here. Oh, please take your time. This is wonderful. I love these. This is perfect, Stephen. So I came back to University of Victoria in 99. I started teaching there in January. And that summer, I was going to be teaching uh, the Cordier and Field School we ran for the first time. And I was going to be running it with uh, Chris Barnes, who was the chair of the department. And uh, he, Chris was a, was a conodon specialist, uh, stratigrapher, carbonate, you know, petrologist. Didn't really give much of a rip about the Cordier and tectonics. So mm. I was studying up on Cordier and tectonics. I'd been away from it for three years, hadn't thought about it. And I was reading this paper by Jim Munger, a nice review paper on uh, the unfinished plate tectonic revolution and understanding uh, the Cordillera. 
And I hadn't really paid much attention to Alaskan geology, but I was remember looking at this figure and just thinking, you know, this ophiolite belt here in black forms this big notch. Mm -hmm. and, and then I knew that, in fact, there's another ophiolite belt that's not well shown here that comes back across Alaska through here. And there's a bit of it called the Slide Mountain back here. And I thought, my God, look at this. It looks like uh, a great big Z or a Z, as you would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what if you straighten that out? <laughs> I'll bet you you would get 3,000 kilometers of displacement. <laughs> and, um, and I was kind of dumbfounded by the thought, and I didn't know where to go. And it turned out I didn't have to go very far because the Alaskans had already recognized this. A guy named Jim Dover and Stephen Box, I think both USGS people, called this the Big Z. And they had already mapped it out. And, and in fact, this is from... Uh, Stephen Box paper published in 85, I think. And um, there's the Cretaceous Koyukuk arc in here, wraps around this purple. This purple is just the foot metamorphic footwall rocks. You know, we could think of it as Yukon Tanana or Ruby terrain in Alaska that lie in the footwall of the Koyukuk arc. And you can see that this big Z, and it's accentuated because younger faults, the Denali, for example, and the Tentina have sort of extruded this portion of the uh, of the Z, but um, but there it is. It's what they called the Big Z, and they interpreted this as being the primary paleogeography of the coast. Mm. And they their interpretation was that the Koyukuk Arc had come in and wrapped around the um, the existing Big Z. Uh, paleogeographic coastline. And I thought, well, maybe, but maybe it just is a terrain wreck. Maybe it was originally straight and it's been buckled into this, uh, into this Z or Z geometry. And mm -hmm. if we're talking about thousands of kilometers of displacement, which is what the paleomag says, then you have to start thinking mobilistically and start thinking, well, maybe this started off looking much different than it does now. So what's the backstop for this? So if you're bringing things north and you're creating the Z, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of, of one of the comments that Merle Beck made about a year ago where he, I think I asked him just by email, why did you go down to South America after all that Baja BC stuff in North America? And he said, well, I just you know, I wanted to see if the same story was down there. And he said, Baja BC wasn't in South America because the coastline was hooked like this. So there was no place for northward translation to go in his mind. Uh, and all his paleo mag down there backed that up. Yeah. So here... Is there a Siberia backup, or why, why, why wasn't the stuff just continue to head north, basically, as opposed to buckle up into a Z? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I mean my, my idea is that this, this ribbon continent continued across into uh, eastern Siberia, Chukot uh -huh. Peninsula, and it, it presumably rooted in the Siberian Kraton there and hence couldn't go anywhere so as that it works. as it tries to move north and the question is why does it try to move north it's it's north western end is stuck into siberia and can't go anywhere so it buckles and gives rise to this alaskan peninsula yeah well it's elegant i think all of us can follow that especially if i put that slide back on like my God, there it is. Mm -hmm. um, but I can only guess that there was resistance to something so simple. I, you probably heard the phrase, well, it's not that simple, Stephen. Oh, yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The other thing I've heard is, well, Occam's razor doesn't work everywhere. And, and I'm like, yeah, actually, Occam's razor does work everywhere. <laughs> Just, doesn't, just because it's a complicated story doesn't mean it's not the simplest possible story, right? It's, um, yeah. um, so, 
yeah, I heard it, it can't be that simple, but I, I also heard a lot of justifiable criticism. Um, you know, I had to try and come up to speed with Alaskan geology uh, pretty quickly. And this was just at the fledgling time for the internet. Um, it wasn't easy to get hold of a lot of the literature at that point in time. Wow. Um, and, and, you know, I made a lot of mistakes. I got a lot of things wrong in Alaskan geology. I got a lot of things wrong in <laughs> Canadian geology. I think the first time Bernie Housen ever corresponded with me was after the train wreck was published. And he wrote me, I don't know, shortly afterwards out of the blue and just said, you got the Klamath wrong. You don't understand what the Blue Mountains are. And that was it. And then I was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> All right. Um, Interesting. So yeah, there's, and I, I think I misunderstood the train wreck to some extent. My, um, my, um, you know, thought was, wow, this just looks like cars, you know, buckling and jackknifing as they come off the track. And actually, I got really into um, searching around the internet for photos of train wrecks. And uh, there's a lot of weird people who follow train wrecks out there. And I, I kind of turned into one of them for a while. I started thinking, oh, I better get out of here. So, anyway, um, but the, the crust and lithosphere is too weak to behave like a derailing train. It's not strong enough to buckle in that fashion. And we've, you know, we've subsequently done analog testing and modeling and, and, you know, pretty much shown it's just about impossible to have lithosphere strong enough to buckle in this fashion. So it's probably less like a train derailing and more like um, pond scum. You know, uh, when the wind blows and the pond scum sails yeah. across the pond and then buckles as it hits the shore, I, it's got to be more like that. So it's, um, it's not a strong train it's a uh, pond scum buckling yeah well i can go a bunch of directions here uh, you are an excellent guest can i just say that like this is just so entertaining and pleasant so thank you for that did you have more slides uh, kind of just totally or did you have some just queued up in case we went certain directions or how would you like to proceed i think i just had them queued up that was good I'm a lousy artist, so this was actually a version of the train wreck right here that was done by Rob Vanderveu um, okay. for a paper he published on oroclines, which is what we call these bends because they're mm -hmm. they're bends around vertical axes of rotation. So um, so Rob Vanderveu did a much better job portraying what I was trying to portray in my train wreck paper. But uh, no, I think we can just leave it there. Well, sure. Let's let's leave this one on. So, um, actually, no. Let's take it off for just a sec. So, those two papers, the two thousand one and the two thousand eight, the ribbon continent is the intermontane, not the insular. Am I reading that correctly, or am I oh. inferring that the insular is part of this somehow? Does it matter? Yeah. I was. Um... I mean, I was making enough mistakes on the, the portion of the, uh, the train wreck I, I knew, the intermontane belt uh, and, and, you know, the paleomag that I dealt with. Um, I just wasn't sure what to do with the insular. So I thought, I'll just leave it off. I know that, um, you know, the, the uh, Churn Creek stories kind of bomb proof, I think. And, uh, and so there's every reason to believe and, and you, you can see in, well, in that figure we just had up that let's do it. It actually does include, you know, the, the, um, the insular. So, you know, there's Vancouver Island and uh, the Haida Gwaii, you know, so this is a combined, this yellowy thing here is the combined insular intermontane. So it's there and it's there in the train wreck paper, but, I just don't speak about it. Okay. Uh, what do you mean Churn Creek is bombproof? Well, you, you know, the, the work done by Mahoney and Link and the, uh, and the paleomag show that there's no major translation you can squeeze through there. So, okay. so you can't ask 
um, at least those portions of, of uh, insular and intermontane to have moved with respect to one another. But, okay. and, and this comes back to kind of something Paul Link said, which was, was uh, quite instructive, right? Paul said, we killed Baha BC. You know, it's a zombie. It's, uh, I don't know what it's still doing walking around because we killed it. And, and um, okay, they didn't kill it, which is why it's still walking around. What they did was they very carefully showed that the interpretation that was out there at the time was wrong. And, and that's great. You know, it's fantastic work. It says, this is not where uh, you can look to put a Baja BC fault to accommodate the paleomatic. And, and that was, to some extent, predictable because, because of the CarMax group. The CarMax mm -hmm. group said, well, okay, you know, everyone's talking about Insular and Baja BC. And I, I don't like Baja BC as a name because it, it gives people this impression of a, you know, a skinny little appendage sticking off California. Right. But, you know, and, and so I really like that you've been talking about the whale. I loved Randy's mega whale. I mean, we're talking about something that's not an appendage. We're, we're talking about uh, the whole animal. The whole animal. So, yeah, let's look at, uh, can you... Maybe so. So yellow is the mega whale, I think. Sort of, yeah. Okay. And what's the two shades of blue? Can you help us kind of think about these uh, areas so far inland for the first time? So the the dark blue and the light blue are uh, important, and and this is where I was. Um, uh, starting to think about how how this ribbon continent works. Um, so the the dark blue, well, the, actually the blues are what we call the foreland belt, okay? Mm -hmm. And in fact, the kind of the the eastern edge of the dark blue is the is the edge of the deformed belt. Okay. okay? But the dark belt are Paleozoic continental margin carbonates for the most part. So this is the the west facing continental margin and the light blue are deep water sediments shales and cherts okay so this this large blue area up here in in Yukon and Northwest Territories is uh, what we call Selwyn Basin okay mm -hmm. but the light blue can be followed all the way down through here called Kachika Trough and I didn't show it here, or at least it wasn't. It doesn't make it into uh, Rob's uh, rendition of the train wreck. Uh, we can follow it through here. It's called Robson's Trough down here, and all the way down. Actually, a Ray Price student, Kyle Larson, who's a prof in British Columbia now, um, he showed that this trough continues all the way down here. And not only is there this deep water trough all the way along the margin. But then when you walk across it and you cross over it, you get back into shallow water carbonates. The problem is the shallow water carbonates over here were a continental margin that faced to the east. Hmm. Okay. In, in Yukon, we call this the McAvoy platform. And we come down further south. It's just offset across the Tantina. It's what's called the Cassiar. Uh, I forget what Kyle called it down here, but all the way along here, um, you've got a continental margin that faces towards North America. So you have these two opposing continental margins. And so I didn't put it in here, but I'm thinking that opposing continental margin in this uh, ribbon continent sits along here. So this mm -hmm. is our ribbon continent. It has a Passive margin on its east side in Alaska. Actually, we call this the Nixon Fork, and it faces east into the Dillinger Shale and Chert Basin. And uh, we can, as I said, we've got Cassiar Platform here, the McAvoy Platform here. So this is this east-facing platform that adorned the east side of the Ribbon Continent. So is it too simple to say the blues are North America for sure and the other colors are exotic for sure? 
except <laughs> there's, ah. there's always a problem here. Right. Okay. So we have to, um, in this model here, we have to close a big basin. Yes. Right. So you can see this is, you know, the east, the west margin of North America coming all the way down here. And you can tell how terrified I was of conterminous <laughs> U.S. geology. I was like, holy shit, I'm not going to go there. I barely got the Mexican border right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think this is just 30 degrees latitude here as a marker. That's the 49th latitude. I just thought if I put anything in here, I'm going to get crucified. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so I didn't. Um, so you have to close this basin. Well, how do you close it? Um, you don't close it by subduction beneath North America because mm -hmm. you know we don't have an arc on North America. We have an arc. It's called the Amanika Magmatic Belt, but it's mostly developed on the ribbon continent. But uh, in here, in the Western Foreland Belt, there are these arc plutons mm. that punch through parts of Selwyn Basin, Western Selwyn Basin. So uh, what does this mean? I, I think this means that sediments of North America were accreting to the upper plate as we had west dipping subduction beneath the ribbon continent. And so mm -hmm. as these accreted to this uh, upper plate, they then became essentially upper plate and, and prone to being um, uh, intruded by arc plutons. I think we might have another, do you want me to just advance the slide here? Just yes, see? please. Oh, there, okay. So here's in, in red and light grays are all of these plutons, okay, of the Amanika magmatic belt. Nobody wow. ever speaks about them because, okay, then you would have to have a tectonic explanation for them. They look like an arc, at least they do out here. They go from about 120 million years of age in the West and the young progressively to about 90 million years in the East or Northeast. Mm -hmm. They start off as good eye type um, magmatic arc plutons and they get more and more S type and luminous, meaning that you're melting more and more either continental crust or sediment. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it may be that you're just starting to swallow the uh, North American passive margin as it enters the subduction zone beneath the ribbon continent. And, and this sediment's accreting to the upper plate. And uh, as it accretes to it, it, uh, it then is subsequently intruded by the arc. The arc's going to mm. advance over the accreting sediment. This is excellent. I'm going to try my same question now that we're looking at this. So yellow and green is out in the ribbon continent, the intermontane part of this thing that's out in the water, some distance offshore of North America. Yeah. Uh, the pale blue way off on the right, that's for sure North America. That's for sure North America. Right. But once we get once we get into even gray, we're kind of in this gray zone, no pun intended, where we might have sediments from both directions. Is that what you were gather, kind of saying there? Potentially, yeah. That that would sure. be um, a reasonable interpretation that you've got um, a, a east facing passive margin originally on the ribbon yeah. continent that would have been shedding into uh, this basin. I just call it the medial basin because it's got different names all along, as I said, Dillinger here, Selwyn here, Kachika here, and then uh, anyways, uh, other names down there, as you said, right. just names, right? Um, but yeah, this shale basin is all that's left in terms of sediment that was originally presumably overlying oceanic lithosphere separating North America from the ribbon continent. Okay, well, I'm going to pull back right here because to me, that is a brand new thought. And I thought I, I had kernels of it as I was reading, but I think I, I heard it from you again right there. I think to this point, I've only thought about a former ocean basin by 
getting a big hunk of green rock and holding it up to the camera and looking at an ophiolite. But some of these basins, some of these fine-grained sedimentary basins like the Metau here in Washington or some of these other basins up north, those are potentially representing an ocean basin that is, you have sediments because you're rifting possibly, but you're also getting sediments as you're closing the basin as well. That's a whole new way to look at a bunch of boring shale to me. Is, am I hearing that correctly from you? Yeah, you're, you're hearing it correctly. And you're also pointing out uh, the, the problem. And, and Randy Ankins spoke to this as well. And that is that, um, wh where is the ophiolite? Like people say, okay, if you've closed an ocean between the ribbon continent and North America, um, <clears throat> why don't you have ovulite? Where's the, where are the blue schists? Okay. Um, and, and my answer is, I, look, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. But I, I mean, we have to think about o ophiolites and, and make sure we understand uh, their record. Okay. They almost never occur on the actual suture, right? And, I mean, the term we use nowadays is suprasubduction zone, right? They usually form by um, spreading in the fore arc or potentially the back arc, okay? Yeah. So they're, they're typically upper plate. Yeah. They're, not, uh, they're not really usually a record of the downgoing slab, okay? And you think about it, you know, the downgoing slab is at, you know, what, seven to eight kilometers below sea level, maybe greater than 10 kilometers below sea level when it finally disappears down the trench. It's yeah. freaking impossible to get that up on top of the upper plate. Okay. So, so the idea that we have to have ophiolite um, is a bit of a misnomer. It, it's still a bit of a concern. Okay. Um. Yeah, but I, I I thought I ended the last show with a softball question about ophiolites with Mitch and Karin, and I, I think they were taken aback by my question. I thought I, maybe I'm down the wrong road here, but isn't it easier to get ophiolites up onto land if if you have westward subduction versus eastward subduction? Because I think maybe I'm talking more Hildebrand than you. I'm not sure, but the concept of westward subduction under the ribbon continent brings North America to this fixed uh, thing out in the water. And the concept is we're, we're pulling North America into that trench essentially and allowing then this deep ocean ophiolite stuff to be thrust up onto land. Am I, am I visualizing that in your world? Absolutely. And, and you said you haven't met, El you never met Eldridge Moores? No. But that was Eldridge's, you know, one of his great insights was that to get an ophiolite, you had to drag the continent underneath oceanic lithosphere. You can't, you can't get oceanic lithosphere to jump on top of the continent. You, you've got to pull the continent underneath it. So you're, you're wow. absolutely right. And um, right. yeah. And, and so this is the typical way you pull the continent in underneath an oceanic upper plate. And maybe that's part of what's going on here is that the upper plate in, in these instances, it's the ribbon continent. It's not oceanic. Okay. And so, and maybe, uh, you know, maybe there is ophiolite there. There's hints of there having been oceanic lithosphere all the way along the medial basin. If, if you go to, um, you know, maybe the most important outcrop on the flanks of the medial basin is the Burgess Shale, where we have the explosion of life in the Cambrian beautifully recorded. And right next to Walcott's Quarry, where, where they, they mined all of these amazing soft body fossils, there is a really weird rock, which turns out to have been a serpentinite seep. Okay, so probably an ancient serpentinite seep. If you go just a long strike to the south of, um, of the Burgess Quarry, there's a brucite mine, which oftentimes is associated with serpentinites. So, you know, 
all along here, we get hints that there were there was oceanic lithosphere, but we just don't get wow. any, any of the, we don't get real ophiolite. And I, I do agree though, that it's a cryptic suture and yeah. why it's cryptic, I don't understand. I mean, you'd think somewhere along the margin, there'd be something. <laughs> Yeah. And maybe there is, and we haven't realized it, or we don't know exactly where to look. I mean, there's a ton of things wrong with this model. I People keep rejecting my papers, but I often say, you think you know what's wrong with it? <laughs> I could tell you <laughs> way more things that are wrong with it. But oh, <laughs> fundamentally, I keep thinking that, you know, the basis for this, dealing with the paleomag, and, and then looking at the geology and thinking, well, yeah, the geology actually can be interpreted as, as a ribbon continent separated from and moving with respect to the Kraton. It's beautiful work. I thoroughly enjoyed reading those papers. Uh, viewers, we're coming to you in five minutes. So get your uppercase ready, please. I guess I want to ask two more questions before we go to those guys. Number one, I'm confused about the buckling of the trains, even though you're backing off of the train thing. Let's just, you know, we're, we're, but we're making the Z. Are we making the Z out in the water or are we making the Z along the coast as we're sending the, as we're doing Baja BC? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty of waffling on this one. So in, in the, um, in the train wreck paper in 2001, I, I had it, you know, essentially along uh, the coast that basin kind of closes up and then the the buckle takes place well actually i shouldn't say that in the 2001 i i have it buckling as you close the ocean in the mm. 2008 paper i i waffled and i brought it in and uh totally closed the ocean and then buckled it and uh yeah I'd probably go back to the original 2001 paper uh, to be honest. Um, but um, you can think about it both ways. You know, the, yeah. the longer you leave an ocean open there, I think the harder it is. But I think, you know, I remember some people asking questions on earlier shows. Could could the fault have been subducted? In other words, could the Baja BC fault? And, and my answer is absolutely, right? If you put a transform fault in that basin between the two continents, in the oceanic lithosphere, then you accommodate transform motion within the within oceanic lithosphere, then you subduct it. It's gone. The fault is is in oceanic lithosphere that's been subducted. It's you know being imaged by Corinne and Mitch, but it's pretty hard to image. <laughs> well well back to the Yellowstone mantle plume being out in the water that means intermontanes out in the water 70 million years ago, right? So if we're, yeah, I mean, the classic time to move stuff north is between 85 and 55 and intermontanes out in the water, we gotta be at. It, it, I, almost, I, it almost has to be free of interference from the continent because it does move at quite a clip. Like it's moving at over 10 centimeters a year to the north you know the oh, wow so so you can't really you're gonna have a hard time doing that having it grinding along a san andreas type fault it's it's not feasible it has to be attached to oceanic lithosphere that's subducting to the north and it's dragging this stuff north at 10 centimeters a year and and Yellowstone hotspot, just remember, I'm saying that, that the Intermontane crossed it at 70. Yeah. Okay. That doesn't mean Yellowstone st started at 70. It probably was already in existence. There are, there are probably other traces of the hotspot out there yet to be recognized as such. Okay, I'm not calling you radical because I, I don't know if that's the right label for you, but fun, imaginative, that's kind of what I mean. Like this is this is a blast. 
viewers, we're coming to you. I'm looking for some uppercase. You got another 15. I mean, you're a busy, you're a department chair of a huge geology department. You got another 15 minutes, Stephen? Uh, because I'm a department chair, I'm absolutely going to stay here as long as I can. <laughs> Otherwise, I have to actually answer email or something. There you go. Thanks. Oh, people are loving you here in the comments. You'll, you'll, I hope you take the time to read all those nice comments about you afterwards, Stephen. Um, Papa Gino, where does the 706 line go in your cartoons and how do you interpret it? Is it truly the edge of North American continent? Yeah, the 706 line, that's a, <laughs> a fundamental thing. And we always used to draw it. I mean, um, essentially running uh, west of the Belt Purcell, essentially, all the way north along the uh, eastern edge of the Intermontane Belt. And then we wrap it around the north end of the Intermontane Belt, which right away makes you think, okay, what's that? <laughs> that can't be the shape of the right. continent then, right? That's, right. that's telling us that uh, at least locally, the 706 line isn't a reflection of the geometry of the underlying basement. Okay, but I, I um, yeah, in, in my ribbon continent model, the 706 line probably ends up being out underneath the continental eastern edge of the ribbon continent. Okay, and it, it doesn't, the 706 line doesn't recognize that you've got ribbon continent, continent, against North American continent. And that boundary has got to be further to the east mm -hmm. of the 706 line. Okay. But I think it's a very useful line. And, um, you know, if we follow it down into the States, right, it, it kind of heads coastward, right, to, into yeah. the Sierra Nevada. And, um, yeah. and that's an interesting thing. So, you know, what people usually do with the arc, the Sierra Nevada arc, is they bring it up to the Idaho Batholith and then they cut it across to the, um, uh, to the Coast Batholith, right? They kind of swing it back across. But what the 706 line does is it follows the Amanika magmatic belt. So from that perspective, I tend to think that the Almanica magmatic belt is the continuation of the Sierra Nevada arc, not the coast, not the coast. Hmm. Thank you for the question. Uh, every, every answer now, I'm getting uh, new thoughts here. Amazing. Um, where are you on the one to 10 scale? Everybody's asking that. Um, <laughs> well, so when you first introduced the 1 to 10 scale, I thought, okay, but it's actually a 1 to 10 cube. It's not just a two-dimensional thing because, <laughs> you know, I was, I wanted to, I was kind of shouting at the screen, Nick, it's not just the insular. It's got to be, you know, so I want to say I'm uh, 10 cubed. <laughs> <laughs> He's up there, everybody. Uh Mike asks, can you point to present day analogs to the deformed by crash terrain? Yeah, is there a modern analog for a ribbon continent 8,000 kilometers long? Uh, no, no, and it bothers me a lot. Um, there, there, are, there are ribbon continents, but none of them are of that scale. I mean, you can take, uh, the Indonesian archipelago, which Mitch and Corinne point to as a uh, modern analog with uh, Australia being the North American equivalent crashing into the, uh, the Indonesian archipelago. If you start the archipelago on Asian, you know, autochthonous Asia at the armpit of the Himalaya, you know, that, that archipelago goes all the way down around the Banda Arc that's like 5,000 kilometers. It's getting there. It's pretty close. So that is, I think, you know, Mitch and Corinne, I think that they're, um, yeah, that's a really good 
example of, of what we're looking at. But, um, you know, the, the problem would be, or, or maybe the criticism would be, well, it's not, it's not continent all the way. It goes from continent. And then as the archipelago goes, as you get south along Indonesia, you, you lose the continental basement. But, you know, maybe that's what happens to parts of this Cordilleran ribbon continent as well. I, it's it's mm. still, I would say, a very fledging level of knowledge of, uh, of, of what makes up that ribbon continent. Thank you. Uh, Sky asks, any petroleum production from rocks of the medial basin or rocks west of the Rocky Mountain platform? Uh, like, is there oil being made out on the ribbon continent? So um, the Flathead Valley cuts through the, uh, the belt per cell. And... Um, when I worked for Shell Exploration, we went out to the Flathead Valley to look at um, um, a seep in a uh, farmer's field. And the farmers in the area used to um, uh, run their tractors with uh, this oil uh, that was, it looked like um, apple juice. And it was about as viscous as apple juice, and it was just bubbling out of the ground. Now, uh, you know, you know, I we could talk about the Bell Purcell, but I think Bob Hildebrand, well, <laughs> he owns the Bell Purcell. He's going to talk about <laughs> it, so I'm, I don't want to talk about it too much. But uh, okay. I, that, that's a case of oil coming up through ribbon continent rocks. Okay. Um, but it may be that those are North American source rocks, right? Again, if you've got, as, as Nick was saying, right, if you've got North America uh, pulled in underneath the ribbon continent by, by west dipping subduction, then you'll have North American rocks underneath ribbon continent rocks. And so that, that oil could be North American. I, mm. I can't think of um, any production that I know of that's definitely from the ribbon continent. Well, maybe to close, God, I just had a blast today, Stephen. Uh, mm -hmm. Close, I guess I got a couple, couple other little lines of thoughts. So I, I'm having a hard time with geography and placing this concept. So um, I don't know, let's play this game. So in your office in Edmonton, you're clearly east of a if we're looking for a cryptic suture in a bunch of shale yeah. uh, that has a bunch of displacement on it, uh, it's west of you in Edmonton. Uh, it's east of, give us some place names that many of us would know possibly from Yukon down to Montana or Washington and help us get a sense of where this, this might be the suture between the ribbon continent and old North America. God, my American geography is terrible. <laughs> yeah, we can stick with Connect Canada. <laughs> um, you know, if you're at Banff, you're you're on North American rocks, right? And Thank you, you. you you're driving uh, west through the Rockies. You go to Lake Louise, right? Um, Lake Louise, I'm not sure. I, I honestly, I I have a lot of troubles putting my finger on exactly where and. Um, and okay, then you get just west of Lake Louise, essentially a long strike a little bit, you get to the Burgess Shale, where you where you go from the the good platformal carbonates off into the shale basin. And the mountains change dramatically. You know, you go from these soaring peaks with great cliffs and vistas, and then suddenly, you know, you go into the shale rocks and you get all these rounded peaks and uh and and it's like okay we lost the cliff forming carbonates as soon as you do that i i think it all bets are off and by the time you wow. get to, by the time you get to the trench which is golden that's the the city on the trans canada at the trench you're you're done you're you're into the ribbon continent wow 
Well, that has meaning to me just because it's a small area of British Columbia I know well. I, we, we've been up there a number of times. We just love that area. And that transect right there, that I don't know how you did that, but that's like the only transect that would make any sense to me. So good job but there. It, uh, just to be clear, the trench is not the, the suture, right? The trench is a much younger feature. It may be located where it is because it's over top of a deep-seated structure at depth that might be the suture, but the trench itself is not the suture. It's just a young feature. Thank you. Last question, and you can pass if you want. Mm -hmm. You haven't been working on this stuff for 15 years. Like this is, you were going great guns a decade and a half ago. Is it just uh, wanted a new challenge and head the department at University of Alberta and that's the end of the story? Or you mentioned rejection of papers, like <laughs> how much you want to comment on this? Well, uh, yeah, rejection of papers, well, it happens. So you just have to get over it and get keep going, you know, it's uh, that's that's part of the deal. Um, I, I think what happened was I realized people were not going to buy the train wreck um, because it seemed like such a one-off. Like it was what, you know, you can't have one of anything in geology. If it's, if it's happened, it's got to have happened over and over again. Okay. And so it, this was a valid criticism of the train wreck. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to go find another train wreck. So I, um, so I went to Europe and uh, I did a, sabbatical in Switzerland, and then I did another sabbatical in Spain. And um, what I found was in Spain, the Variscan, the, the um, kind of 300 to 350 million year old mountain system that records the closure of the oceans that gave rise to Pangaea. So in, in northern Spain, northern Iberia, they'd mapped a, a big bend. All right, let me, I'm just like, a huge bend like this that they uh -huh. they call the Cantabrian oracline. And they had good paleomagnetic data showing that this was originally more straight and had, had buckled. And the second thing that really got me intrigued was that um, the formation of Pangaea involved the collision of Gondwana in the south with La Russia in the north, okay? But if you look at the paleomag from the north coast of Gondwana, doesn't fit. Very same story. It's way north of where it should be if it's actually rooted to Gondwana. And the and all of the geologists are like, oh no, the the um, stratigraphy. We can walk these rocks from Cretonic Gondwana into the Gondwanan sediments of Iberia. There's no way the paleomag can be right. And I thought, oh my God, I've heard this before. <laughs> no, I got a PhD student, Jess Shaw, who's just brilliant. And um, I thought, I'll bet you that the Cantabrian oracline in the north has another bend in the south so that it's just like Alaska, except in Alaska, it's a Z, but in Iberia, it's an S. And, and so we went looking for that southern bend, and, and indeed it's there. And if you undo the big S in Iberia, you explain the paleomag. So, so that was what I went to do to show Cordilleran geologists, hey, it's not just the Cordillera. Must have felt good to find yeah. that, my God. No, then the Iberians just reject my papers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a theme running through this whole series, of course. The, the imaginative, uh, I guess, versus folks who are just clinging to the familiar uh, for whatever reason. And 
I don't know. I, I, it doesn't sound like we're going to be able to look forward to any more of your great work on this. Like, I just, I'm just a huge fan of those papers. And did you say you are going to speak at the GSA section meeting in Reno in May? I am. Yeah. Glutton for punishment. No, I'm, I, I have to say, Nick, I've really enjoyed this series because it's, uh, it's really rejuvenated my interest in, uh, in Cordillera. I've kept poking away at it and I still, I've had students publishing papers on aspects of this, but um, yeah, it'd be, uh, it's been great. Well, I look forward to seeing you in Reno then. And uh, yeah, let's just continue to learn from you. This is just a, a real treat. I thought you just did an excellent job. And normally I say that after I say goodbye to a guest, but I want to say it directly to you because I just, I just thought you were perfect. So thank you for that energy and your eloquence and your humor and everything else. And um, I hope to visit with you again sometime, Stephen. Excellent, Nick. Wonderful talking with you. Thank and, you. And thanks, thanks to everyone for listening. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Okay. Have a good day. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> I will leave. <laughs>
uh, some of the detail here. And I thought this was the time, if you have not seen this essay yet, call, it was, it's time to put this in. So if you have not read this, or if you have, but you haven't read it in a while, this is a column by Paul Hoffman. And uh, it is just written as a, a little story about uh, putting the work of Tanya Atwater and Karin Siglock and Bob Hildebrand and Steven Johnston into perspective uh, with the plate tectonic revolution and other things as well. So last show you met Karin and Mitch, this show you're meeting Steven and uh, they are featured in this, in this column. Uh, a few slides to finish this out here. I uh, got an email today from Backcountry Eric up in British Columbia. And Eric said it uh, might be helpful to show some of these from the Omanika belt. Uh, so in addition to a few of Stephen's uh, backcountry photos, you can get a sense of uh, Precambrian Hamel group and uh, Jurassic Selkirk stocks. These are all photos. I don't even really know where we are, Eric, but thank you for the photos. Backcountry Eric uh, Kolb from Vancouver Island with beautiful photos from the Omanika belt, which I guess is on the ribbon continent. I'm pausing now. I kind of don't even really know where the Omanika is, but I'm, my hunch is that our mysterious suture, our cryptic suture between ribbon and old North America is to the east of here. I think that's what Stephen was saying today, right? Bugaboo, I've heard of it, Provincial Park. Yeah, even even uh, Eric is like, well, I don't know. We're either uh, on some uh, basinal uh, shales and siltstones of North America, or we're on the uh, passive margin of of Sabia, which is which is the the, for, the old name of the Ribbon Continent. Here's our buddy Stephen and Karin 10 years ago in Munich, photo taken by Mitch uh, shortly after Karin's big paper uh, that was published in 2013. Uh, I sh I'm going to show this again, mainly to ask questions. I thought maybe I would do this before I brought Stephen in, but you know I've been doing laptop afterwards lately. Um, I can drive now. So I'm driving. So we are 170 million years ago. Mitch showed us this, remember, in the last show? So this is from, this is mostly data from the, the slabs in the lower mantle. But here's part of the, what ends up as being the Alaska train wreck. And know, notice what they're doing. They're going to make the Z out in the water. There it is, right there. And then they're going to kind of get it into place. Here's the Z of current day Alaska. And after Wednesday's show, no, after Saturday's show with Karn and Mitch, and Mitch pointing this out, I thought, oh, okay, so this is definitely a way offshore story of creating the Z. But then I was confused as I was reading the 2001 paper by Stephen and he's, he's got the Z forming as a direct result of Baja BC. And you heard him say, he's kind of waffling still about the timing of this. Again, I'm gonna drive. Purple is intermontane. So notice that insular and intermontane have a vast ocean between them. And they don't close, Karn and Mitch don't close this ocean between insular and intermontane until 120, I guess. And then they have a mega whale that's going to start heading north a little late. Like they're really starting it north about 70 and getting it up to like 40. That's a little younger than our, than our story. If you're looking for major messages from today, this blue area 
is where the Ribbon Continent guys, Stephen and Bob, want to have major amounts of translation. They do not want, uh, they don't see evidence, or they don't see reason to be looking carefully for Baha BC faults all through this hinterland, which is, you know, most of the exotic terrains are here. You know, Hildebrand's emailing me after each show, like, why are you over there? That's misleading. It's like, you're not going to find anything. You guys are not looking east, basically. Uh, this is kind of what I tried to do on the chalkboard. This is from Karin and Mitch's 2017 major paper, which you do have. I uh, kind of took the inspiration from this, and that's what I did on the chalkboard. Karin and Mitch do have some eastward subduction, plenty of it, but they have it before 170, and they have it younger than, I don't know, 50? And here's Stephen today. Intermontane and insular, if we're forced to do it that way, a mega whale out in the water. We touched on these concepts today. Not sure how much you followed if you had not read the paper. Here's taking those snapshots from the 2001 paper and just trying to get them together. This is what's going to become Alaska. In the 2001 paper, Stephen's like, there is no Alaska until 85 million years ago when you start Baja BC. Like you're just shoving all that, all these train cars up there and uh, you're making the entire state uh, between 85 and 55, like during Baja BC time. I spent a lot of time with this one. It took me forever to even really grasp what was going on. But I think I have it. And, and Stephen kind of did this a little bit with us today. Here's Vancouver Island. And here's Vancouver Island. So this is looking at the positioning of what we consider, I think, rather familiar landmarks. Uh, well, these are less familiar to me because they're way the hell up in, in Alaska and Yukon, and of course they've been folded as well. But this is the ribbon continent. If, you, if you're grasping for, if you're still with us, number one, you feel like you never got in on the ground floor with this. That's my fault, I guess. But here's our 8,000 kilometer long and 500 kilometer wide ribbon continent offshore of old North America. And this is Intermontane, which makes up much of central British Columbia now. Like, uh, I think this is, well, it's definitely Stikine and Cache Creek, maybe some uh, Quinellia as well. Here's the, I'm going to mispronounce these now. Here's the Slide Mountain, I think. Here's the Cassiar platform, the Selwyn Basin, I believe. And I lose it, the folded but the point is, look at the latitude of these things. They're way south. This is Mexico. I didn't think, I should have said this with Stephen. I didn't think there was any paleomag in the Intermontane that had like 3,000 kilometers of offset. But don't you need 3,000 kilometers of offset if you're taking stuff from here and getting it up across the border into Canada? Am I I'm, I'm missing some of the paleo mag? And then maybe this is what Bernie was talking about with him. You got the Klamath next to Idaho Basilith. Is, are you, here's our belt supergroup. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, ribbon continent. Interesting age progression of plutons. Now, Bob Hildebrand's going to look at this very carefully next time. And westward subduction of ocean floor as you close the ocean between North America proper, Rocky Mountain platform, and everything west of it being out in the water. I'll show it, but I don't get it. Like, here's the terrain wreck. That's 
Intermontane. I'm not even really sure what this thing is. Is this this other fixed deal? All right. So, of course, two hours. I got a couple quick things to say to get you ready for our next show. Last, last time saying that I thoroughly enjoyed Stephen Johnson and I hope that you did too. But before I toast him and toast you, I think I want to get you ready for Bob Hildebrand because he's a unique guy. This is one of the many publications of Robert Hildebrand. And yes, we'll be talking about the ribbon continent both Saturday and the following Wednesday, but there's going to be way more. And so I'll, I'll just, I'll just full disclosure. You ready? Hildebrand's the only guy that has said, sure, I'll do that, but I need two shows. I need two letters. I got so much I want to share with the viewers. I can't possibly do it in one show. So I said, I'll think about it. And then a couple of weeks later, I'm like, okay, Bob, you got two shows. Thank you for wanting to be part of the series. And, uh, and then a week later, he's like, uh, my first show, I don't, I, don't want you, I don't want you to introduce me. I don't want you to do anything on the chalkboards. I got 45 slides. And I'm like, Bob. I don't want this to be a Zoom talk. He says, I have to do it that way. I have too much stuff. It has to be linear. And so I'll, I'll stop every once in a while. I'll let you kind of get in there and ask a couple of questions. But he, he's, he's eager to share what he has. And there is so much that I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of stuff ahead of time. Because I think I'm going to honor Bob's request. I'm not going to do any of the clown show on the chalkboard. I'll basically go, take it away, Bob, <laughs> and eat a ham sandwich or something. I don't know. <laughs> That's Saturday. So there will be an extra amount of stuff posted of Bob's for his Saturday show. I'd have you look at some of that ahead of time. I think it would help. But this was Bob's suggestion. I think we're going to do it. If you have the time and you really want to get the most out of Saturday's show, especially since I'm not going to be setting him up much on Saturday, have you seen an interview that I did with Bob Hildebrand about a year ago? If not, I'm going to show you how to get to it right now. And I think watching this interview with Bob Hildebrand before Saturday will be helpful to you. Let me just go to YouTube here. Dr. John Campbell. That's not going to do it. There he is. Robert Hildebrand interview with Nick Zentner. Okay. So this is an hour and 20 minutes <laughs> of... Mostly Bob talking, me getting a few questions in, getting the backstory on him. Uh, there's no maps. There's no visuals. It's just a conversation. Um, and I was down in Tucson and happened to set up a visit with him uh, to hear his backstory and to just kind of get introduced to him. And so Bob is wondering uh, if you want to get a sense of him, and really be able to kind of hit the ground running on Saturday. I don't know. I have to do something at the beginning. For those that have never have not seen that interview and haven't read any papers, I, I, Bob, I got to do a couple minutes. I can't. I have to do a couple of minutes. But Bob, I, I promise that on Saturday I'm going to do a very short amount of chalkboard stuff. People have seen the interview. They'll have looked at your papers a little bit, and then. It's a ham sandwich show, and you're on.
And especially with this episode today, where we're getting familiar with the concept of westward subduction, let's just getting started to think about that. And the ribbon continent, I think we'll be ready. Things are ready to uh, enjoy our Robert Hildebrand meal on Saturday and the following Wednesday. But that's down the road, and we need to do a toast to you and our guest today. A toast to you. Thank you for joining us today for episode S, Ribbon Continent, with Stephen Johnston. Schoenheit. A heartfelt thank you to Stephen Johnston, an excellent guest. Thank you, Stephen, for your time and what you did with us today. Here's to your health. Here's to the health of your family and friends. Everyone in your community, wherever you happen to be, on this beautiful planet. A special thanks to those watching live and those that make it a habit of watching live. It's a very unique and heartfelt way to support what's going on here. There's no money, right? There's no money. So that's your way to say, I appreciate what you're doing and I want to make sure there's a decent sized group uh, enjoying these shows live. And so I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Thank you for taking the time to be with us live. It's very meaningful, and I think it adds to this experience. I know it does. So here's to you. Schedule. Hang on. So as discussed already, we have uh, show T on Saturday January 28th of 2023 at 9 a.m. That's Bob Hildebrand. And the following show you on the first day of February at 2 p.m. Pacific time. That will also be Bob Hildebrand. And then I continue to work on the remaining part of our alphabet series. That's plenty for today. That's got to be a record or close to it. Thank you, everybody. I love you. And we'll see you Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA.